Welcome to our game development tutorial series. Today, we embark on an adventure into the captivating realm of 2D game development. Our journey begins with the creation of dynamic mazes using Unity, C Sharp, and the backtracking algorithm. Following this, we will delve into the implementation of a pathfinder utilizing popular search algorithms such as the A star and explore how to apply pathfinding within these mazes. Mazes have long been a staple in video games, offering players a challenging and immersive experience as they navigate through winding pathways and hidden corridors. And now, with Unity, you can bring these intricate mazes to life in your own projects. In this tutorial, we will take you through the step-by-step -step process of generating mazes in Unity 2D. From setting up your project to implementing the backtracking algorithm for maze generation. By the end of this video, you'll have the skills and knowledge to create captivating mazes that will keep your players engaged and entertained. Go ahead and create a new Unity 2D project, naming the project Unity Maze Gen. Once Unity is loaded, rename the default sample scene as scene underscore maze generation. We will first create a room prefab. We will use this prefab as a unit cell in the 2D grid. For this tutorial, we will keep things simple. We will create a room that is made up of four walls. Right click on the scene hierarchy and create a new empty game object. Rename it to room. Select this game object and then add a new 2D square sprite. Resize it to have a length of 5 units and a height of 1 unit. Change the transform's position value with X as 0 and Y as 3. Rename this sprite to top. Now, duplicate the sprite and change the position to Y as minus 3. This change will relocate it to the bottom. Rename the sprite to down. Similarly, now add another 2D square sprite. This time, resize it to have a length of 1 unit and a height of 5 units. Change the transform's position value with X as 3 and Y as 0. Rename this sprite to right. Now, duplicate this sprite and change the position to X as minus 3. This change will relocate it to the left. Rename the sprite to left. After that, create 4 more 2D square sprites for the 4 corners, each of size 1 unit. Rename these four sprites to corner underscore left top, corner underscore right top, corner underscore right bottom, and corner underscore left bottom. Change their positions to X as minus 3 and Y as 3, X as 3 and Y as 3, X as 3 and Y as minus 3 and X as minus 3 and Y as minus 3 respectively. We will now add the floor of the room by creating another 2D square sprite, resizing it to 7 and 7 and setting the Z value to 1. Change the RGB color of the sprite to 150, 150 and 150. Select all the wall and corner sprites and change the RGB color to 200, 200 and 200. Go to the project window and create a new folder called scripts. Add a new script called room in this folder. Add this script component to the room game object. Double click the room script and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. This script's main purpose is to control and manage the visibility of walls in different directions and enable the creation of a continuous walkway for the maze. We start with defining an enumeration called directions. This will help us identify the different directions our walls can face, top, right, bottom, and left. We declare some serialized fields of type game object to represent the walls in each direction. These fields will be assigned in the Unity editor. Next, we create a dictionary called walls, which maps each direction to its corresponding wall game object. We then implement a property called index of type vector to int. This property will store the index of the room in the game grid. We also add a Boolean property called visited, which indicates whether this wall has been visited or not. By default, it's set to false. Another dictionary called direction flag is used to store the flag indicating whether each direction's wall is active or not. 
In the start method, we populate our walls dictionary with the assigned game objects for each direction. This allows us to easily access and manipulate the visibility of walls in different directions throughout our game environment, providing a convenient way to control the state of individual walls based on their direction. We then define a private method setActive that takes a direction and a Boolean flag indicating whether to activate or deactivate the wall in that direction. Finally, we implement a public method called setDirectionFlag, which allows us to set the flag for a specific direction's wall and update its active state accordingly. This method will be called by the maze generator later when we implement it. Now, go to the Unity editor and select the room game object. After that, associate the wall game objects with the correct script wall field in the inspector. Go to the project window and create a new folder called Resources in the Assets folder. Go inside the Resources folder and create a new folder called the Prefabs. Drag and drop the room game object inside this Prefabs folder to make the room a prefab. We shall now start with the maze generation process. For this, create an empty game object and name it Generate Maze. Create a new script called Generate Maze in the Scripts folder. Drag and drop this new script into the Generate Maze game object. Double click the script and open it in Visual Studio or your favorite editor. We add a variable called the Room Prefab. This variable will hold the prefab of a single room in our maze. We then add the 2D array of rooms. This variable will represent the grid of rooms where our maze will be constructed. Then we add the variables that will determine the number of rooms along the X and Y axes of the maze grid, respectively. They will define the size of our maze grid. After that, we add two float variables, room width and room height. These variables will store the width and height of each individual room in the maze. We will calculate these values based on the dimensions of the room prefab. Now we add a stack data structure that we will use for backtracking during maze generation. Finally, we add a Boolean variable called generating that will indicate whether maze generation is currently in progress. It will be used to prevent the initiation of a new maze generation process while one is already underway. We will now implement the getRoomSize method. This method is responsible for determining the width and height of the individual room prefab that will be used to construct the maze. We begin by obtaining all the child sprites of the room prefab using getComponents in children method. We then initialize two vector3 variables, minbounds and maxbounds, to positive and negative infinity, respectively. These variables will be used to store the minimum and maximum bounds of the room prefab. Next, we iterate through each child sprite obtained earlier using a for each loop. For each sprite renderer, we update the minbounds and maxbounds variables using vector3.min and vector3.max functions to ensure they encapsulate the entire bounds of the room prefab. After iterating through all child sprites, we calculate the width and height of the room prefab by subtracting the minimum bounds from the maximum bounds along the X and Y axes, respectively. These values are stored in the room width and room height variables. Next, we implement the set camera method. This method is responsible for positioning the main camera in a way that ensures the entire maze is visible within its view. First, it calculates the position based on the dimensions of the maze grid and the size of each individual room. It positions the camera at the center of the maze grid, slightly adjusted to ensure that it captures the entire maze. After that, it determines the minimum dimension of the maze, either the total width or height, and sets the orthographic size of the camera accordingly. This ensures that the entire maze fits within the camera's view, with a little extra padding around the edges for better aesthetics. Next, we implement the start method.
This method is called when the script is initialized, typically at the beginning of the game, or when the object containing the script is enabled. We first call get room size to calculate the size of each room in the maze based on the dimensions of the room's sprites. Then, we initialize the 2D array rooms to store references to each room in the maze. Next, we use a nested loop to iterate through each grid position in the maze, with num x rows and num y columns. Inside the loop, we instantiate a room game object at the calculated position based on the grid index, i and j, and the size of each room. We set the name of each room game object to indicate its position in the grid. We retrieve the room component attached to each instantiated room game object and store it in the rooms array at the corresponding grid position. Finally, we call set camera to position and adjust the main camera to ensure the entire maze is visible within its view. We now implement the remove room wall method. This method is responsible for removing a wall of a given direction from a specified room in the maze. In this method, we first set the flag of the wall in the specified direction of the room at position x, y to false, indicating that the wall should be removed. Then, based on the direction provided, we determine the opposite direction from which we will remove the corresponding wall in the adjacent room. Using a switch statement, we check the provided direction and update the opposite direction accordingly, considering the boundary conditions to avoid accessing out-of-bounds array elements. For case top, it checks if the given room is not at the topmost row of the maze. If true, it sets the opposite direction direction to bottom and increments the y. For case right, it checks if the given room is not at the rightmost column of the maze. If true, sets the opposite direction to left and increments the x. For case bottom, it checks if the given room is not at the bottommost row of the maze. If true, sets the opposite direction to top and decrements the y. For case left, it checks if the given room is not at the leftmost column of the maze. If true, sets the opposite direction to right and decrements the x. This method could be very error-prone. Pay special attention to the boundary conditions. Finally, we call the setDirectionFlag method of the adjacent room to set the flag of the wall in the opposite direction to false, effectively removing the wall between the current room and its adjacent room in the specified direction. Now we shall implement the function getNeighborsNotVisited, which is responsible for finding neighboring rooms that have not been visited yet. This function takes in two parameters, cx and cy, representing the x and y coordinates of the current room. Next, we initialize an empty list named neighbors to store the neighboring rooms that have not been visited. We then loop over each direction using a for each loop and the enum.getValues method to get all possible values of the directions enum. Inside the loop, we declare variables x and y to represent the coordinates of the neighboring room, initially set to the current room's coordinates. For each direction, we use a switch statement to handle the different cases. In each case, we calculate the coordinates of the neighboring room based on the current room's coordinates, and then check if the neighboring room is within the bounds of the maze and whether it has been visited or not. If the neighboring room meets the criteria, we create a tuple containing the direction and the room and add it to the neighbors list. We do this for all the cases. Be very careful while implementing this function. It is very error prone.
Finally, we return the list of neighboring rooms that have not been visited yet. We will now proceed to implement the generate step method, which plays a crucial role in maze generation. Within the method, we start by checking if the stack of rooms is empty. If it is, it means that we have explored all possible paths, and we return true to indicate that maze generation is complete. We then peek at the top room in the stack to examine its neighboring rooms. Next, we call the get neighbors not visited method to find neighboring rooms that haven't been visited yet. If there are unvisited neighboring rooms, we randomly select one of them. We mark the selected neighboring room as visited and remove the wall between it and the current room. Finally, we push the selected neighboring room onto the stack for further exploration. If there are no unvisited neighboring rooms, we backtrack by popping the current room from the stack. At the end of the method, we return false to indicate that maze generation is still in progress. After this, we will implement the create maze method. Inside the method, we begin by checking if maze generation is already in progress. If it is, we simply return without doing anything. Next, we call the reset method to reset the maze's state. This involves marking all rooms as unvisited and resetting their walls to their default state. We have not yet implemented this method. We then remove the bottom wall of the bottom left room to ensure there's an entrance point to the maze. Similarly, we remove the right wall of the top right room to ensure there's an exit point from the maze. We then push the bottom left room onto the stack to be the first cell in the maze. Finally, we start the maze generation process by invoking the coroutine underscore generate method as a coroutine. This allows us to visualize the maze generation process step by step. We now move on to implement the coroutine. This coroutine is responsible for controlling the maze generation process. We start by setting the generating flag to true, indicating that maze generation is currently in progress. We initialize a Boolean variable flag to false. This flag will be used to determine whether maze generation is complete. Inside a while loop, we continuously call the generate step method until the flag becomes true, indicating that maze generation is complete. After each iteration, we yield wait for seconds with 0.05 seconds. This pauses the coroutine for a short duration, allowing us to visualize the maze generation process step by step. Once maze generation is complete, we set the generating flag back to false. We shall now implement the reset method. In this method, we iterate through the nested for loop and sets the flags of all four walls, top, right, bottom, and left, to true, indicating that they are intact. Additionally, we also reset the visited flag of each room to false, indicating that the room has not been visited during maze generation. Finally, we implement the update method where we check if the spacebar key is pressed. If the spacebar is pressed and the maze generation is not currently in progressive, call the create maze method. This allows the user to trigger maze generation by pressing the spacebar key while ensuring that maze generation does not overlap if it's already underway. We will make one final change in our code. We will add a direction of type none in the directions enum. Go to room script and add a new direction of type none. This enum type is required to handle special cases of entry and exit. After that, open the generate maze script again and make changes to adapt to this new direction. Go to the remove room wall method and check for none direction enum. If the direction enum is none, then do not call the set direction flag. Set the default value of opposite direction as none. Then if the direction enum is none for the opposite direction, then do not call the set direction flag. By doing so, we are handling the boundary cases for wall removals. Now, go to the Unity editor. Select Generate Maze Game Object from the hierarchy.
Go to the inspector and associate the room prefab field by dragging and dropping the room prefab from the prefabs folder. Click play and press the spacebar. See the maze generation in action. Press the spacebar again to recreate the maze. You can also change the grid size in the inspector and test it out. And that's it. We have implemented our dynamic maze generation in Unity 2D using the backpropagation algorithm. In the next section, we will implement the Pathfinder. And finally, in the last section, we will use the Pathfinder to find the path between the start and goal positions within the maze. We will enhance the maze generation with some modifications to allow visual representation of the pathfinding process. Let's update our room prefab to enable visualization of pathfinding within the maze. Navigate to the prefabs folder, double click and open it. Select the square sprite and change the RGB color to 100, 100, 150 respectively. After that, duplicate the square and rename the first one to floor. Rename the second one to Marker. We shall use this sprite as a marker to show the start and end points in the maze. Change the Z value of the marker to 0.5 and the size to 3, 3 in the X and Y axes. Navigate to the Scripts folder, then double-click to open the room script in Visual Studio. Add two variables of type sprite renderer named Floor and Marker. We will use these sprite renderers to apply colors during the pathfinding process. Add a color variable named normal underscore color and set its default RGB values to 100, 100, and 150. We will use this color later to reset our marker. We now proceed to implement some functions to manage the visual aspects of pathfinding. First, we implement the set floor color function. This function sets the color of the floor sprite to the specified color. Then, we implement the set marker as start function. This function activates the marker and sets its color to green, indicating the start position. Similarly, we also implement the set marker as goal function, which activates the marker and sets its color to red, indicating the goal position. The reset marker function resets the marker's color to the predefined normal color, while the reset floor function resets the floor's color to the normal color as well. These functions help in visually distinguishing different states and roles of the elements during the pathfinding process. After that, we go to the Unity Editor, drag and drop the floor sprite to the floor field of the script and the marker sprite to the marker field of the script. We want to enable setting the start and goal positions by clicking on the maze with the mouse. Double click and open the Generate Maze script file in Visual Studio. Create two variables called start pos and goal pos of type vector 2 int. By default, both the start and goal positions are set to 0, 0. When a room is selected by clicking the left mouse button, it is designated as the new goal position, and the previous goal position becomes the start position. We shall now implement the function raycast and set start, which handles setting the start and goal positions in the maze based on mouse input. This function first converts the mouse position from screen coordinates to world coordinates, creating a ray position. It then performs a raycast at this position to detect any colliders.
If a collider is hit, the corresponding game object is retrieved and the room component is accessed. The markers for the current start and goal positions are reset. The start position is updated to the previous goal position, and the goal position is updated to the room detected by the raycast. Finally, the markers for the new start and goal positions are set accordingly, visually indicating these positions within the maze. Now, go to the update method and add in the code to handle the left mouse button down event and invoke the raycast and set start. After that, go to the Unity editor, open the room prefab and set a box collider 2D component to it so that we could handle the raycast. Resize the box collider 2D component to 7, 7 in the X and Y axes to match the room size. Click play and select any room to set it as the goal or destination. Initially, the start position will be room, zero, zero. With each subsequent click, the previous goal will become the new start. Later, we will use pathfinding to navigate between these start and goal rooms. You can also press the space key to see the maze generation, which we implemented earlier in this video. And that's it. We have implemented dynamic maze generation in Unity 2D using the backpropagation algorithm. In the next section, we will implement the Pathfinder. And finally, in the last section, we will use the Pathfinder to find the path between the start and goal positions within the maze. In this section, we will develop a pathfinder that will help us determine the path between a starting room and a destination room within the maze. Go ahead and create a new c -sharp script. Name it Pathfinder. Double-click and open it in Visual Studio. Remove mono behavior, then remove the start and update methods. We want our class to be plain c -sharp class and not derived from mono behavior. We start by adding an enumerator type called Pathfinder status. This enum defines the different states that the Pathfinder can be in during its operation. The first state is not underscore initialized. This status indicates that the Pathfinder has not been initialized yet. Initialization typically involves setting up the start and goal nodes for the pathfinding operation and preparing any necessary data structures. When the Pathfinder is in this state, it's not ready to start searching for a path. The next state is success. This state indicates that the Pathfinder has successfully found a path from the start node to the goal node. It means that the pathfinding algorithm has completed its task and identified a valid path that meets the specified criteria. We then add the state failure. This state indicates that the pathfinder has been unable to find a valid path from the start node to the goal node. It could occur due to various reasons, such as an unreachable destination, blocked paths, or limitations of the pathfinding algorithm. Finally, we add the state running. This state indicates that the pathfinder is currently searching for a path. We then define an abstract class called Node. Making it abstract means we can't create instances of Node directly. Instead, it serves as a blueprint for other classes. Also, it uses a generic type T, which means it can work with any type of data, making it really flexible. We can create nodes to hold different kinds of information. Then we have a property called Value. This property is where we store the actual data that the node represents. The get allows us to read the value. The set is marked as private, meaning we can only set the value within this class itself, not from outside. We then define the constructor for our node class. It takes a parameter value of type t, which we then use to set it to the value property. 
And finally, we have a method called get neighbors. It is marked as abstract, which means any class that inherits from node will have to implement this method. This method is responsible for finding all the neighboring nodes connected to this node. But because it's abstract, we don't provide an implementation here. Instead, each subclass of node will define its logic for finding neighbors. Depending on how we represent map data, either as a grid or as a graph, we will have a specific implementation of this method. We now create a class named Pathfinder. It is marked as abstract, just like the node class we saw earlier. That means we can't directly create an instance of Pathfinder. Instead, it's meant to be used as a blueprint for other classes that will perform pathfinding algorithms. We use a region to organize our code visually. Think of them as section dividers. First, we define some delegates. Delegates are like function pointers in C++. They're used here to define the signature for calculating costs between nodes. We have two types of costs, heuristic cost, which estimates the cost from a node to the goal, and node traversal cost, which calculates the cost between two neighboring nodes. After that, we end the region. We then start with another region and define a nested class called Pathfinder node. Nested classes are classes defined within another class. We have implemented this class as a nested class here as it will mostly be used by our Pathfinder class. The class implements the iComparable interface, which means instances of this class can be compared to each other. This class is crucial because it represents nodes within the search tree generated by the pathfinding algorithm. Unlike the node class we saw earlier, which was abstract and served as a template for various types of nodes, this class encapsulates a specific node in the search process. Inside the class, we define various properties and methods that will help us manage these nodes during the search process. We start with the property named parent. This property represents the parent node of the current node in the search tree. In other words, it points to the node from which the current node was reached. We then add a property called location, which represents the actual node that this Pathfinder node is associated with. It stores the reference to the node in the graph. We then add a few new properties that represent different costs associated with the node. Gcost is the cost from the start node to this node, Hcost is the heuristic cost from this node to the destination node, and Fcost is the total cost of reaching this node, which is the sum of Gcost and Hcost. After that, we add a constructor for this class. This constructor initializes a Pathfinder node with the given node as its location, the provided parent node, and the specified gcost and hcost. It then calls the setGcost method to set the gcost and update the fcost accordingly. Then we implement the setGcost method. This method updates the node's gcost and recalculates the fcost based on the new gcost and the existing hcost. We will now implement the iComparable interface. This method allows instances of Pathfinder node to be compared based on their f-cost. It returns a negative value if the current node's f-cost is less than the other node's f-cost, zero if they are equal, and a positive value if it's greater. We finish off by calling the end region, and that wraps up the Pathfinder node class. We will now continue with the Pathfinder class by defining another region called properties. Remember that putting sections of code between a region is just a way to organize our code visually, making it easier to understand and navigate. Then we will define a property called status. This property represents the current status of the pathfinder. It can have values like not underscore initialized, running, success, or failure. By default, it's set to not underscore initialized. The get accessor allows us to read the value of status, while the private set accessor means that only methods within this class can change the value of status. After that, we define properties for the start and goal nodes of the Pathfinder. These properties allow us to access the start and goal nodes from outside the class, but they can only be set internally, hence the private set modifier. This encapsulation ensures that only the Pathfinder class can modify these nodes. Lastly, we add another property called current node, which represents the current node that the Pathfinder is exploring. This property allows external classes to access the current node, but it can only be set internally by the Pathfinder class. We end this section of code by adding the end region. 
we start once again with a region to organize our code. To manage the open and closed lists in the pathfinding algorithm, we will define two lists, open list and closed list. Open list will keep track of nodes that have been discovered but not yet explored, while closed list will store nodes that have already been explored. We will then create a helper method called getLeastCostNode. This method will take a list of Pathfinder node instances as input and return the node with the lowest F cost. It will iterate through the list, comparing the F cost of each node and keep track of the index of the node with the lowest cost. We will also define another helper method called isInList. This method will check if a specific value of type T is present in the list of Pathfinder node instances. It will iterate through the list and compare the value of each node's location with the given value cell. If a match is found, it will return the index of the item in the list, otherwise it will return minus 1. After that, we end the region. We will now define another region titled Delegates for Action Callbacks, where we will declare delegates to handle changes to internal values. The game will utilize these delegates to represent alterations to the cells and lists visually. These delegates will facilitate triggering specific actions or behaviors in response to various events during the pathfinding process, allowing for visual representation and interaction within the game environment. We start by declaring a delegate type delegate pathfinder node intended to handle methods that take a pathfinder node as a parameter. Following this, we declare instances of the delegate pathfinder node delegate type called the onChange current node, on add to open list, on add to close list, and on destination found. These delegates will be assigned methods that take a Pathfinder node as a parameter and will be invoked when certain events occur, such as changes to the current node, addition of a node to the open list, addition of a node to the closed list, and discovery of the destination node. Next, we define another delegate type, delegate no argument, which will handle methods with no parameters. We proceed by creating instances of the delegate no argument delegate type called on started, on running, on failure, and on success. These delegates will be assigned methods with no parameters. They will be invoked when certain events occur, such as the start of the pathfinding algorithm, when the algorithm is running, when the algorithm fails to find a path, and when the algorithm successfully finds a path. Finally, we end the region. Next, we will define a method called reset, which will reset the internal variables for a new search. Within the method, we will first check if the status of the pathfinder is set to running. If it is, we will not perform the reset and simply return from the method. Next, if the pathfinder is not currently running, we will set the current node to null, clear both the open and closed lists, open list and closed list, and reset the status of the pathfinder to not initialized. This reset method will ensure that the pathfinder is ready for a new search by clearing all previous data and resetting its status. It's an essential step before starting a new pathfinding operation. We will now define a method named step, which will handle the progression of the pathfinding algorithm until it either succeeds or fails. Within this method, we'll begin by adding the current node to the closed list. Next, we'll check if the open list is empty. If it is, we'll set the status to failure, invoke the onFailure delegate if it's not null, and return the status. Then, we'll get the least costly element from the open list and make it the new current node. After that, we'll remove the current node from the open list. Now, we'll check if the current node contains the goal cell.
If it does, we'll set the status to success. Invoke the on destination found delegate if it's not null. Invoke the on success delegate and return the status. Following that, we'll find the neighbors of the current node and traverse each of these neighbors for possible expansion. Within each iteration of the loop, the method algorithm specific implementation is called with the current neighbor node cell as an input parameter. This method is abstract and must be implemented by subclasses of the Pathfinder. It's meant to handle specific implementation details or operations related to the pathfinding algorithm, such as evaluating the cost of moving to the neighbor or updating the path based on the neighbor's properties. Lastly, we'll set the status to running, invoke the onRunning delegate if it's not null, and return the status. Finally, we define the abstract method algorithm specific implementation that is not directly implemented here. This method is expected to be implemented by subclasses and will handle specific implementations required by the pathfinding algorithm. We will now define a method called initialize, which will initialize a new search in the pathfinding algorithm. First, we'll check if the status of the pathfinder is set to running. If it is, we'll return false because pathfinding is already in progress. Next, we'll reset the variables to prepare for the new search operation. Then, we'll set the start and goal nodes for this search. After that, we'll calculate the heuristic cost for the start node using the provided heuristic function heuristic cost. Now, we'll create a root node with its parent as null and initialize its g-cost to zero and h-cost to the calculated heuristic cost. Subsequently, we will add this root node to the open list, and then we will set the current node to the root node. Then, we'll invoke delegates to inform the caller if they are not null. This includes the onChange current node delegate to notify of the change in the current node and the onStarted delegate to signify the start of the pathfinding operation. Finally, we will set the status of the pathfinder to running and return true to indicate successful initialization of the search operation. We then bound these three methods within a region for better code organization and clarity. We have now implemented the basic structure of the pathfinder. However, it is not yet able to do the pathfindings, as we have not implemented any algorithm-specific implementation. We shall now proceed to implement the three well-known types of algorithms for pathfinding. We will start with the first algorithm, known as the Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm explores paths uniformly, considering all neighboring nodes without any heuristic guidance towards the goal. It guarantees finding the shortest path, but it can be computationally expensive, especially in large graphs. Since Dijkstra's algorithm does not use any heuristic function and relies solely on the accumulated cost from the start node to each node being considered, the H cost is always zero. We start by defining a subclass of Pathfinder called Dijkstra Pathfinder, which implements Dijkstra's algorithm for pathfinding. Within the Dijkstra Pathfinder class, we will implement the abstract method algorithm specific implementation. It is an override of a method in the superclass. This method is responsible for implementing the specific logic of Dijkstra's algorithm for each cell. In this method, we check if the current cell is not in the closed list, meaning it has not been visited yet. Next, we calculate the tentative cost, g cost, to reach the current cell from the starting node. Since this is Dijkstra's algorithm, we don't consider the heuristic cost or the h cost. Then, we check if the cell is already in the open list. If not, we add it to the open list with the calculated costs.
If the cell is already in the open list, we check if the newly calculated cost is less than the existing cost for that cell in the open list. If it is, we update the cost and parent of the cell in the open list. This process ensures that Dijkstra's algorithm explores nodes based on their distance from the start node, updating costs as it discovers shorter paths. Next, we will implement the A-star algorithm. The A-star algorithm uses a heuristic function to guide the search towards the goal, prioritizing paths that are more likely to lead to the goal. It combines the cost to reach a node from the start, which is the G-cost, and an estimated cost to reach the goal from that node, which is the H-cost. A-star is generally more efficient than Dijkstra's algorithm because it tends to explore fewer nodes while still guaranteeing an optimal solution if an admissible heuristic is used. The A-star algorithm performance heavily depends on the quality of the heuristic function. In the worst case, A-star may behave similarly to Dijkstra's algorithm, but with a good heuristic, A-star can significantly reduce the search space and achieve better performance. We continue by defining a subclass of Pathfinder called A-star Pathfinder, which implements the A-star algorithm for pathfinding. Within the A-star Pathfinder class, we implement the algorithm specific implementation function. In this method, we first check if the current cell is not in the closed list, meaning it has not been visited yet. Next, we calculate the cost to reach the current cell from the start node. This is the cost of the path from the start node to the current cell. We also calculate the heuristic cost, or H cost, from the current cell to the goal node. Then, we check if the cell is already in the open list. If not, we add it to the open list with the calculated costs. If the cell is already in the open list, we check if the newly calculated cost, the G cost, is less than the existing cost for that cell in the open list. If it is, we update the cost and the parent of the cell in the open list. This process ensures that the A-star algorithm explores nodes based on their combined cost, which is G plus H, where G is the actual cost from the start node, and H is the heuristic estimate of the cost to the goal node. Next, we will implement our final algorithm for pathfinding, called the Greedy Best First Search Algorithm. Greedy Best First Search is an uninformed search algorithm that explores a graph by prioritizing nodes based on their heuristic value. It selects the node that appears to be closest to the goal according to a heuristic function without considering the actual cost of reaching that node from the start. In contrast to the Dijkstra algorithm, the Greedy Best First Search algorithm does not use the cost to reach a node from the start. Instead, it purely relies on the heuristic cost to the goal node. Greedy Best First search is fast and can quickly find a solution if the heuristic function is well designed. However, it does not guarantee optimality, meaning it may not always find the shortest path to the goal. Due to its greedy nature, it can get stuck in local optima or loops, especially if the heuristic function overestimates the actual cost to reach the goal. Therefore, while greedy best first search is efficient, it may not always produce the most optimal solution. We can copy and paste the Dijkstra Pathfinder, change the name of the class to Greedy Pathfinder. Then we set the G cost to be zero and H cost as the calculated heuristic cost. The remaining functionality remains unchanged. This process ensures that the Greedy Best First Search algorithm explores nodes based solely on their heuristic values without considering the actual cost from the start node. In the previous section, we implemented a generic pathfinder capable of applying the A-star, Dijkstra, and Greedy Best First search algorithms. In this section, we will adapt our maze to use the A-star pathfinding algorithm to find the path from a start position to an end position within the maze.
First, we will create a new concrete class called room node, derived from the pathfinding node class with the generic type vector 2 int. Go to Unity Editor, and from the scripts folder, right click and create a new script file called room node. Double click and open it in Visual Studio. Remove mono behavior and the start and the update methods. We extend this class from the generic node class with a type parameter of vector 2 int. In this class, we first define a member variable named maze, which represents the maze where the node exists. Then we create the constructor, in which we set the maze variable and the room's 2D index value. Finally, we override the getNeighbors method of the base class to obtain the neighboring rooms of the current room within the maze, We do this by simply invoking the GenerateMaze class getNeighbors method with the x and y coordinates of the current room's index. We have not yet implemented the getNeighbors method in the GenerateMaze class. We shall do that next. Go to the GenerateMaze script class and add a new method called getNeighbors. This method returns a list of node objects with a vector 2 int type parameter. It takes two integer parameters, xx and yy, which represent the x and y coordinates of a room in the maze. We then initialize an empty list called neighbors, which will store the neighboring nodes of the current room. After this, we create a loop that iterates through each direction defined in the room.directions.enum. The enum.getValues method returns an array containing the values of the enum. We create two local variables, x and y, that are initialized with the input coordinates xx and yy, representing the current room's position. Based on the current direction, the code then enters one of the switch cases to determine the neighboring room in that direction. For the top direction, the code checks the conditions if moving upwards from the current room does not exceed the upper boundary of the maze, and if there is no obstacle in the top direction of the current room. If both conditions are met, the y-coordinate is incremented, and a new room node instance representing this neighbor is added to the list of neighbors. For the right direction, the code checks the conditions if moving to the right from the current room does not exceed the right boundary of the maze, and if there is no obstacle in the right direction of the current room. If both conditions are met, the x-coordinate is incremented, and a new room node instance representing this neighbor is added to the list of neighbors. Similar actions are taken for the bottom and left directions, but they involve decrementing the y or x coordinate respectively and checking for boundaries in the opposite direction. After iterating through all directions and adding valid neighbors to the list, the method returns the list of neighboring nodes. We have not implemented the utility method called getDirectionFlag in the room script. Go ahead and implement the utility method as shown in the video. Go back to the GenerateMaze script. Now we shall implement the two cost functions that will be used in our pathfinding algorithm to calculate distances between cells. The Manhattan cost function computes the Manhattan distance between two cells represented by vector 2 int A and vector 2 int B. The Manhattan distance is the sum of the absolute differences of their x and y coordinates. This distance metric is appropriate for grid-based pathfinding where movement is restricted to horizontal and vertical directions, just like in a city grid. The cost between two cells function calculates the Euclidean distance between two cells. 
This distance is computed using the Pythagorean theorem, which involves taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences in the x and y coordinates. This metric gives the straight line distance between two points, making it suitable for scenarios where diagonal movement is allowed or when an accurate real-world distance is needed. After that, we add three functions that will help us visualize the pathfinding process. The first method, called the onChange current node, is called when the pathfinder changes the current node it is evaluating. It takes a pathfinder node object as a parameter. Inside the function, it retrieves the x and y coordinates of the current node's location and sets the color of the corresponding room to magenta. This visual change will help indicate which node is currently being processed in the pathfinding algorithm. The second function, called on at open list, is called when a node is added to the open list, which contains nodes that need to be evaluated. It takes a pathfinder node object as a parameter. The function retrieves the x and y coordinates of the node's location and sets the color of the corresponding room to cyan. This color change visually indicates that the node is in the open list, awaiting evaluation. The third function, called the onAddToClose list, is called when a node is added to the closed list, which contains nodes that have already been evaluated. It takes a Pathfinder node object as a parameter. The function retrieves the x and y coordinates of the node's location and sets the color of the corresponding room to gray. After that, we implement a utility function called ResetColor, which is designed to reset the colors of all room floors in the maze to their default color. We shall now add a pathfinder of type A star pathfinder. Next, we will implement the find path method. This method initializes and starts the pathfinding process, setting up necessary parameters and visual feedback mechanisms. It first checks if the pathfinder is already running. If it is, a message is logged, and the method returns early to prevent starting a new pathfinding operation while another one is in progress. Then we set the heuristic cost function to Manhattan cost and the node traversal cost function to cost between two cells we implemented earlier. After that, we call resetColor function to clear any previous pathfinding visualizations from the maze, ensuring a clean slate for the new pathfinding process. Then, we assign the event handlers to provide visual feedback during the pathfinding process. These handlers will change the color of the rooms as nodes are added to the open list, closed list, or as the current node changes. We then initialize the pathfinder with the start and goal positions. This sets up the pathfinding algorithm with the start and goal nodes. Finally, we start a coroutine named coroutine underscore find path step to execute the pathfinding process in steps, allowing for visual updates and smoother execution over multiple frames. We will implement this coroutine next. We then implement the coroutine coroutine underscore find path step, which handles the step-by-step -step execution of the pathfinding process. This allows for real-time visualization and smoother performance by spreading the pathfinding computation over multiple frames. Inside, we enter a loop that runs as long as the pathfinder's status is running. Inside the loop, the pathfinder.step method is called to advance the pathfinding algorithm by one step. The yield return new wait for seconds introduces a short delay of 0.05 seconds between each step. This delay is intentional to slow down the pathfinding process, making it easier to visualize the algorithm's progress in real time. After that, it checks if the pathfinder status is success after the while loop terminates. If the pathfinding is successful, the coroutine on success pathfinding is started to handle displaying the found path. We are yet to implement this coroutine. Finally, it checks if the pathfinder status is failure. If so, the onFailure pathfinding method is called. We have not implemented this method yet. 
Now, we shall implement the coroutine coroutine underscore on success path finding, which is responsible for handling the visualization of the path found by the pathfinder once the algorithm successfully completes. Inside, we first declare a variable called node, which is initialized with the current node from the pathfinder. We then create a list named reverse underscore indices to store the path indices in reverse order, from the goal node back to the start node. After that, we use a while loop to traverse back from the goal node to the start node by following the parent references of each node, adding each node's location to the reverse underscore indices list. After that, we update the node with the parent node, continuing the traversal until it reaches the start node, where the parent is null. To visualize the path, we use a for loop that iterates over the reverse underscore indices list in reverse order, from the start node to the goal node. For each coordinate in the path, the corresponding room's floor color is set to black, visually marking the path. We introduce a short delay between each step, allowing the path to be visualized progressively. Next, we implement the onFailure pathfinding function, which just prints out a debug log stating that no valid path could be found. Finally, go to the raycast and set start method. Towards the end, invoke the call to find path. Before we can perform our pathfinding, we need to do one last thing. Go to the room script and in the start method, set all the direction flags to true. This will indicate that there are walls on all four sides. Then reset the floor and the marker colors. Finally, we will hide the marker game object when we reset its color. This is necessary because the marker sprite is only used to represent the start and goal rooms. Hiding it for all other rooms prevents visual anomalies. Go to the Unity Editor and click Play. Click the left mouse button on any room. Now, you can view the locations of the start and end rooms as the markers are visible. The debug log indicates that no valid path is found. This occurs because all rooms are enclosed by walls on all four sides, preventing the pathfinder from discovering any paths. Press the spacebar key and generate the maze. Once the maze is generated, the pathfinder will be able to find the path. Once the maze generation is complete, click the left mouse button to select the destination room. Now, you should witness the pathfinding process in action. You can observe the changes in the current node, displayed as magenta-colored rooms. Additionally, rooms in the open list are depicted in cyan, while those in the closed list appear in gray. Upon finding a path, it will be visualized in black. And with this, we conclude our tutorial implementing pathfinding in dynamic mazes using a star algorithm. We hope you have enjoyed our tutorial. Please leave your comments and subscribe to our channel for more such tutorials.